everyone. Just having a couple people still joining. Um, and in case uh, you missed it, just want to let you know that we are recording this event. Um, so if you wish not to be seen, you can keep your video off and, and rename yourself if you'd like. Um, yes, and that's a, a good point. Um, we would also ask that you remain muted um, throughout the event just to uh, keep background noise to a minimum. Okay, and I think we'll get started now. So I'm gonna pass it over to Laura uh, for our living land acknowledgement. Oh, Laura, I think you're going to need to unmute yourself. <laughs> of course, that had to happen. Didn't it? Yeah. So, um, a living land acknowledgement is um, is something that's a bit different than a traditional land acknowledgement. It's um, an opportunity to kind of reflect on on uh, all of the land acknowledgements you've given and how uh, you're thinking thinking has changed and your understanding has changed and how that thinking and understanding has been reflected in land acknowledgements. So um, here goes. I woke up to the paralyzing climate science in 2013 when I stopped thinking about global warming and began to understand the climate crisis. My focus was on the future we've created for ourselves. I got active, I began organizing, I wanted everyone to wake up and to act and to avoid the ca catastrophic and violent future that we will leave to, to the generations that follow us. At that time, I understood land acknowledgements as a respectful way to begin gatherings. I would say that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people, um, that we acknowledge this as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on, and as a way of honoring the Indigenous people who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Over time and through new and beautiful relationships with some of the original people of this land and through deeply thinking about the root causes of the multiple crises we're facing, I began to see such acknowledgements as an opportunity to invite others to think about what we have done and to reflect on the systems and structures that have caused the injustice that surrounds us and that we continue to benefit from at the expense of others. I learned about the treaties and promises that were made and broken I realized that we are living on stolen land, and I would say that land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context, that colonialism is a current ongoing process, and that we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. And I would say that we are on stolen land, and that the climate crisis is a crisis whose symptoms are ecological, but whose root causes lie in an economy Ill, structurally ill-equipped to respect land, labor, and human dignity. And as I spend more time with the knowledge keepers, the Medewin, the storytellers, and the water walkers, and more time on the land and with the water, understanding my life in relation to all life on Earth and to the water that sustains us, I've come to appreciate that climate change isn't a technological problem or an economic problem. It is, at its core, a relationship problem, resulting from a breakdown in our relationships with each other and with the land. This is a crisis that can best be addressed through a relational worldview a worldview characterized by the concept of a circle, interconnectedness, and connection to place, a worldview based on respect, reciprocity, responsibility, and relationships. And so now I ask people to think about the worldview that got us here and the worldview we will need to get us out of this mess. And I say that I would like to begin this gathering with a statement of gratitude to and political acknowledgement of the Indigenous caretakers of this land. Now I say that this is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples who exist in a deep reciprocal relationship, not only with the land and the waterways, but also with the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to this place, their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. And now when I offer a land acknowledgement, I express my gratitude to the land and to all life on earth. And I invite others to learn from, listen humbly to, and take our cues from what the first peoples of these lands are telling us to do, to do whatever work we are doing in solidarity with the original peoples of this land and to actively support land back campaigns. And I acknowledge that our lives and work reflect the privilege of benefiting from the removal of indigenous people 
Americans from their territory and that we commit to using that privilege toward restitution and reconciliation. Land acknowledgements are an essential and respectful way to begin gatherings. And I've also come to understand that they are much more than that. Land acknowledgements are a local place-based response to multiple global crises and an opportunity to help us to begin to heal our relationships with one another and with all we can be. Back to you, Katie. Thank you so much for that, um, Laura. So I just want to go over some Zoom um, housekeeping for uh, this event. Um, so uh, we will be using the chat this evening as a way um, to engage and to ask questions of our speakers. Um, so you can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as I said earlier, this um, event is being recorded. So if you wish uh, not to be recorded, you can keep uh, your video off um, and you can change your name if you'd like. Um, and then of course, just to stay on mute to limit uh, background noise. So let's begin by testing out that chat function um, by sharing in the chat what faith community or faith communities you are a part of. Um, so you can just share that in the chat if you feel comfortable. Uh, my, I myself am part of um, the Mennonite community here in KW. Um, yeah, we've got some other Mennonites here. Lutherans, chat's going real fast. I can't catch everything. <laughs> oh, some Presbyterian. Catholic. <laughs> um, amazing. Anglican, awesome. This is exciting. Thanks everyone for sharing. Um, I also want to briefly introduce uh, Faith Climate Justice Waterloo Region, one of our co hosts uh, for tonight's event. Um, so Faith Climate Justice Waterloo Region began last year with a group of people um, who came, of people of faith who came together with the goal of building on the good work um, of this space um, and growing the local movement of faith communities, taking action and speaking out for climate action and climate justice. Our goal is to bring together people of faith to raise collective voices to create the political will necessary uh, for our government to take climate action commensurate with the scale of this crisis um, that is also grounded in social justice. One of our initiatives um, are banners being hung on buildings of faith communities um, in the region. And there's a couple of faith communities have already purchased and we're beginning to hang up these banners. Um, and these are a way of uh, raising awareness and pointing people to action. Um, so we're excited to see this campaign grow and to help connect faith communities around climate justice um, and to build a local movement. Um, yes, uh, so I'm now gonna pass it over to Kai, who's gonna speak a little bit about 50 by 30, our co-host for this evening. Hi there. Um, it's so, so wonderful to see so many people um, joining us today. Uh, welcome. So yeah, uh, once again, um, 50 by 30 is a, uh, local grassroots initiative. It's uh, an initiative for climate justice uh, here in Waterloo Region. And specifically, uh, we have been calling the region of Waterloo uh, to commit to a 10 year target of 50% uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction uh, below 2010 levels uh, by 2030 and really to lead uh, the just transition 
that is necessary for a more equitable, safe climate future. Um, so this, uh, this effort really has been grounded in social justice concerns from the beginning. Um, collaborating with other movements uh, throughout the region, um, all as well as uh, recognizing that by doing our part uh, to, to reduce emissions on climate change in a, a wealthy, innovative region such as, as Waterloo, um, the, there's a strong justice um, component to that as well. Um, we look at our, our responsibility uh, both here in our region uh, to care for all residents of, within the region as well as more broadly around the globe. And so we know that uh, bending the curve to flatten this uh, upward trajectory of emissions that has been responsible for climate uh, disruption is really essential uh, to protect billions of people from the global threat posed by uh, the worst impacts of climate change. And that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, has been incredibly clear that we need to reduce emissions globally uh, on a pathway that would include a 50% reduction by uh, 2030 and 100% um, by 2050 uh, if we are to you know, limit warming and maintain something that resembles a safe climate future. Um, this is in line with the Paris Climate Accord to limit warming to two degrees uh, C and aim to maintain it below one and a half degrees C. Um, so all of that means action now um, and 50 by 30. Um, part of the climate emergency declaration that was adopted regionally in uh, fall of 2019 is the idea that we have to avoid these worst impacts um, in line with the Paris Accord, uh, which again means a commitment to uh, 50 by 30. Uh, and many, many municipalities are beginning to step up and uh, realize uh, that the time for action is now. Um, and so we are essentially building on what is a global movement, a groundswell with people uh, from across uh, the region organizing this campaign since the spring. Uh, and we're now looking for, for broader public support as we prepare to meet with uh, regional councillors. Um, you can find out more about our campaign at 50by30wr.ca uh, um, and uh, do sign the petition while you're there. Uh, and you can uh, find out more about ways to engage at the ends of, uh, of tonight's event. Um, but really, uh, we, we are happy to, to be here with you um, in this, this effort uh, for a more just um, and fair uh, Waterloo region. So um, I just realized I have the pleasure of introducing, we had a, a switch up in speakers at the, um, with, with myself at the last moment here. So I'm going to introduce uh, Chris Fletcher, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Um, and he is part of uh, the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change at the University of Waterloo. Um, his research uses computer models of the global climate system to better understand climate variability and change primarily over North America and Europe um, on timescales ranging from seasons to decades um, to centuries. So it's my pleasure. Uh, Chris has pre-recorded a uh, video for us to kind of dive into the science here. And I'm going to be uh, pulling that up and uh, that should hopefully work smoothly. So this is just a 10 minute video um, to ground us in the moment that we're in. Climate scientist and a contributing author to the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I'm here today to speak about climate science and climate change projections, what we can expect 
across the world, in Canada and in Waterloo region in the coming decades. I'm going to speak about emissions reductions and the impacts that that can have on climate change projections. Let's begin somewhere that we're all incredibly familiar with, our amazing planet Earth. This is the view from space from NASA's Blue Marble. So here's the climate system with clouds and aerosols and land and ocean and ice in all its glory and complexity. Let's start by thinking about carbon dioxide, which is the most important greenhouse gas in terms of climate change and what carbon dioxide has been doing in the atmosphere for the past 800,000 years. And basically what they've been doing is oscillating around uh, values close to sort of 250 or 225 parts per million, occasionally peaking when we come to interglacial periods and then going down when we have glaciations, but never getting above 300 parts per million. And that brings us all the way up to the near past. And so it's of great interest to see what's been happening since that time. And that is shown by this dashed orange curve. And you can see that carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are now unprecedented. We are above anything that's been measured in the um, ice core record up to now. So our fine planet Earth has a problem. And like any child um, that is spiking a fever, you know, we're spiking a CO2 fever and we have lots of other symptoms that go along with that as well. So firstly, the temperature of the Earth is, uh, has been increasing since about 1850 and has warmed by almost one degree Celsius over that period since the Industrial Revolution began. This is the global average, so the average of the surface temperature of the entire planet. We can break down the warming and look at what's been happening across different regions, and the pattern looks like this. So the redder, purpler colors are more warming, and you can see generally there's more warming uh, over continents than over ocean, and there's more warming at higher latitudes, so over Canada and parts of uh, northern Eurasia, down in parts of South America as well. This is all consistent with our understanding that greenhouse gases are driving warming of the climate system and that warming tends to be maximized in areas where there's lots of snow and ice like Canada and Eurasia. But it's not just temperature that's the problem. We're also seeing changes in the climate since pre-industrial times in things like snow cover. So there's less snow on the ground in spring. There's much more heat that's measurable in the upper layers of the ocean. The amount of frozen uh, Arctic Ocean that we see, this is the sea ice extent, is decreasing somewhat dramatically. And the sea level, as the ocean warms, is rising because the water volume in the ocean is expanding. And we've seen a pretty steady increase um, of sea level since 1900. As well, there's been well-documented increases in record-breaking heat events that are associated with these observed changes. So all of this evidence points to the fact that Earth has a, has a problem, Earth has a fever, and this is something that we need to take seriously and think about what's gonna happen in the future. So in order to think forward into the future, climate scientists need to use computer models to make projections about what the climate system is going to do in response to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. So here's Earth again in all its complexity, but here's what Earth looks like in a computer model world. And this is what me and my research team tend to spend most of our time looking at. So the computer model is a digital representation of all of the complexity in the climate system. And we can use this tool to make uh, projections and predictions about what Earth's climate is going to do in the near and the long-term future. And we do that following things called scenarios. So we run what-if type experiments and we say, well, what if our emissions go on unchecked and um, we have no success in mitigation? What will happen to the climate then? Or alternatively, we can ask, well, what if we're successful with mitigation and able to reduce emissions significantly, what will happen then? So here's that global average surface temperature metric again, and I'm going to show results from climate model projections 
for two different what-if scenarios. So the red line here shows a what if we don't really do anything to do with mitigation. This is what if we carry on with our business as usual. And you can see that the amount of warming that we get far exceeds that one degree that we've already seen. In fact, it looks more like three or four, possibly even five degrees. However, if we are successful with mitigation and we're able to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, in fact, take emissions to net zero or below, then we can follow something like the blue curve. So climate models are very useful for telling us about what potential changes might happen in future if we follow particular emission scenarios. Here's what those projections look like in a spatially resolved way. So we can see that for temperature warming, again, much more over places like Canada and the Arctic and more over land than over ocean. If we think about precipitation, then generally countries like Canada and Northern Eurasia and other Northern regions will experience increases. So generally that means more rainfall because we're getting less snow in the winters in Canada as the climate warms. But there are also regions that will dry, particularly those that are already drier to begin with, such as these in the subtropics of the North and the Southern Hemisphere. So big changes are afoot if we fail to make any kind of success with mitigation. The climate change is happening on small scale regions and that's how it's gonna affect individuals. So what can we tell about climate projections for regions like region of Waterloo? So we did a study in 2015 and we looked at many different metrics of climate change to do with temperature and precipitation. And this was one figure that really stood out. So if we're thinking about extreme heat, those really hot days in the summer when the temperature goes above 30 degrees Celsius, then the number of those days that we have at present is shown by this dash black line. It's around 10 days per year on average where the temperature goes above 30. In the 2020s, in the near term, that number is not going to change very much. It might increase a bit. But have a look in the 2050s and then by the 2080s. And this is when our decisions about emissions and mitigation really make a difference. Because if we follow that business as usual uh, trajectory, then by the 2050s, we could be seeing as many as 30 days above 30 degrees. That's a whole month, 30 degree plus weather. And then if you look to the 2080s, we're looking at almost two entire months of the summer where temperatures exceed 30 degrees in Waterloo region. Contrast that with the net zero um, emissions trajectory and we're able under that scenario to keep extreme heat to levels that are very similar to today. So there's an urgent need for action on emissions reductions and I can demonstrate that by looking at these figures from the IPCC special report on the 1.5 degree target from the Copenhagen and Paris agreements. So here's the observed uh, trend in temperature shown by the gray line. The red line shows exactly how much of that is due to human activities. And that takes us right to about 2018. Let's think about what is in store in the near term. So basically out until about 2040, the next two decades. Well, regardless of what we do on emissions, the fact is we've baked some climate change into the system already. So there is warming that we have committed to based on our past emissions and really nothing that we can do between now and 2040 is going to have anything to do with the warming that we see. We can't really get out of that. And so we're expecting potentially um, another almost half degree. So getting to that 1.5 degree target is not going to take very long. However, we need to act soon. In fact, we need to act now because whatever changes we make today will not be felt in terms of climate change for another two or three decades. And that is shown by the continuation of this graph out to 2100. And this now follows a bunch of different scenarios for what if we're able to dramatically reduce emissions such that we hit net zero. So in order to stabilize, flatten the curve in terms of temperature increase, what we need to do is something like this to emissions. So here we are today in 2020, we basically need to begin cutting emissions 
and continue cutting them to reach net zero around 2055 or even 2040 to achieve this blue curve in terms of stabilization. So we really have to get moving now and there is an urgent need for emissions reductions in order to see temperature respond in the next um, 30 or 50 years. I could say a lot more on this, but I don't have time. Please reach out to me and contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye for now. Okay, I think uh, at this point I am handing it over um, to Scott uh, to talk about uh, the need for a faith-based response. Thanks, Kai. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Morton Minomia, and I'm part of Faith Climate Justice, and I live here in Kitchener, Waterloo, and I'm super excited about this event. Uh, I am the last person who's going to speak before we get to the star of the show, which is Christine Boyle, of course. So um, I'll say a few things. Um, we've been informed by science uh, with, through Chris Fletcher, and, but it's our faith that inspires us to act on climate change. People of faith and goodwill have been a powerful driving force behind climate action for a very long time around the world and here in Waterloo Region. And tonight we honor their passion, their pragmatism, and the path that they illuminate for us to follow. We also recognize that we must greatly accelerate our journey down the path to climate justice. As we just heard, the next decade is crucial to tackle the climate crisis. Here in Waterloo Region, we're in a position of privilege where climate impacts will not be as swift or severe as many other places, and that gives us a moral obligation to do more. People of many spiritual beliefs are already engaged in climate action around the world. Indigenous leaders have never relented in their efforts to remind us, remind us all of our connection and moral duty to creation. Muslims have made a global climate declaration in 2015. Catholics organized a national climate conference in the Philippines in 2019. A Jewish climate action network formed recently in the US. One of the other voices speaking locally to the need for climate action is that of the Ecumenical Climate Justice Alliance and members of that alliance are with us here tonight. These are only a few examples. My engagement with climate action as a person of faith has intensified over the last few years. In 2019, I heard then Ontario Environment Commissioner Diane Sachs speak at an event organized by Faith in the Common Good in Kitchener at Kitchener City Hall. And I imagine that many of you were there at that event. Diane Sachs called on faith communities to speak with a strong and unified voice to governments about the need for accelerated climate action. Soon after that, I started speaking myself about the climate crisis to fellow Mennonites at our churches across Waterloo Region and found many people concerned and already taking action. A few of us formed a grassroots group that grew into faith climate justice, largely organizing during the pandemic to help keep climate justice on the radar, even during the pandemic. Tonight's event is one among many that I hope will happen in coming years to expand and connect our collective efforts across faiths. As people of faith gathered here online tonight, we recognize a stark and common reality. Whatever our creation story may be, we know that creation, our shared home, is now under its greatest threat from us. The science tells us what we need to do, and frankly, it looks incredibly daunting. That is where our faith can help us to do what needs to get done. Whatever our faith may be, may it give us the vision, hope, and perseverance to boldly meet the challenge of climate change. When we gather together, collaborating between communities, we see that there are so many ways to engage in climate action, in our worship, in the ways we use energy in our buildings, in political action. We can speak with many voices and bring a plethora of skills and gifts to this, the most important work of our time. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Laura Hamilton to introduce our, our star for the evening. Thank you. Thank 
it's Scott. You might have to lean in, Laura. Oh, thank you. Sorry, my internet was freezing. Um, I have the uh, honor of introducing Christine Boyle to you this evening. Um, Christine is a United Church minister and community organizer and communications specialist uh, born and raised on unceded Coast Salish territory in Vancouver, BC. She is passionate about tackling inequality, contributing to climate justice, and deepening democratic engagement. Christine spent four years supporting progressive local governance and leading strategic communications at the Columbia Institute Center for Civic Governance. She organized training conferences for progressive local leaders in BC, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, and supported the research and development of innovative municipal policy solutions. During that time, she also supported the development of Green Jobs BC, bringing together environmental, labor, and community leaders to advocate for a just transition. Prior to that work, Christine was on the staff of First United Church in Vancouver's downtown east side, doing programming and community outreach. Christine also created Spirited Social Change, an initiative aimed at engaging people across generations to explore the intersections between faith, spirituality, and our work for a better world. Through that work, she was part of initiating and leading the self-care project and fossil free faith. And this is how I came to know Christine, through our collective efforts in support of faith and the common good back in 2013 and 14, and while Chris and, and uh, at that time, Chris really inspired our work as we established Divest Waterloo, as Chris was spearheading the national efforts within the United Church to divest the church's funds from fossil fuels. In 2015, she traveled to the Vatican for events around the release of Laudato Si, the Pope uh, Francis encyclical on climate change and the economy. And then later that year, she was a civil society delegate to COP21 Paris summit. Um, she joined uh, the Canadian Memorial United Church and Center for Peace as Minister of Community Life in January 2016 and was ordained as a uh, minister in the United Church in 2017. She has a Bachelor of Science in Urban Agriculture and First Nation Studies from UBC and an MA in Religious Leadership for Social Change from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Counselor Christine Boyle was elected Vancouver City Council with One City Vancouver in 2018. One City is a political party and progressive voice for people and communities in Vancouver focused on affordable housing, climate justice, better transportation, child care, a sustainable economy, and a strong public education system. One City is working for an inclusive, vibrant, and affordable city, a city for everyone, not just a few. So I think by now it must be clear to everyone here why we are so delighted to have Christine here to speak with us this evening as we consider climate justice in the context of our collective efforts to create a better world and to support our municipalities to aim high, establish a 50 by 30 target to do our fair share to address the climate crisis. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. Um, it is uh, so great to be joining you um, and having this conversation and I am going to keep a close eye on the time because I love talking about all of these topics um, uh, and I'm keen to hear your questions and make sure um, that we get to shape some of the time around them. So uh, I am joining you from the traditional unceded territories of um, Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil First Nations and uh, as others spoke to, the work of climate justice is deeply interwoven with indigenous rights and land sovereignty and, and governance sovereignty and the return of land. So I think that's an important uh, place to begin the discussion. Um, as you heard uh, in, in um, my uh, bio, the worlds of faith and climate action and local 
government action are all very near and dear to my heart. That's sort of the center of the Venn diagram that I live in. So I'm excited to be part of this conversation with you all. Uh, I am a United Church minister. Uh, I trained at a multi-faith Unitarian seminary down in California. My partner was raised in a progressive Jewish home. My kids have been attending climate rallies uh, since a couple weeks after birth. So I'm um, glad to be part of this world with you now and hopefully in, a, in an ongoing way. Um, I really start in this work from uh, the fact that we're facing a climate emergency. And I wanna tell two stories that sort of situate my um, place in this work. So uh, the first is, the first story is around engaging faith communities at the scale of the crisis. Uh, and I will start by admitting, I only really got engaged in climate work after theological school. Before that, my work was really focused on poverty and inequality and human rights. Um, and it was Hurricane Katrina that got me paying closer attention to the human impacts. Uh, and as we know, the very inequitable human impacts of climate change. It wasn't um, the graphs, uh, the science, the pictures of polar bears. Um, and I mentioned that uh, I think it's really important that we speak to the science, particularly in naming the scale to the crisis. Um, but certainly for me in this work, that wasn't what motivated me to action. And I think that's one of the important pieces of Faithful Voices uh, in this work. So uh, at the time that I started paying attention more closely on climate, the Harper Conservatives were um, in government federally. We had a pretty conservative provincial government here in BC pushing pipelines and expansion of fracked gas. Um, and uh, there was very little room for hope. Um, I was in my mid twenties and I, uh, I felt a lot of despair pretty quickly about climate. Um, the divestment movement, uh, the divestment and reinvestment movement is really where I found that hope. And so that's where I leaned in. Um, I was able to, uh, to work within the United Church, my home um, com faith community around divestment to see uh, some movement on that nationally. Um, and I continue to be really inspired by faithful uh, fossil fuel divestment work globally, um, particularly there's some been some really significant announcements within uh, within Catholic faith institutions around fossil fuel divestment. Um, and I am struck by how that work connects us to faithful involvement in past movements around apartheid, especially, uh, as well as how it gives us some paths forward that, uh, like my own involvement, in early climate action that um, give us reasons to hope and that work at the scale of the crisis. Um, similarly, on the reinvestment side, I was uh, glad to be able to do some good work with Faith in the Common Good, whose leadership around green buildings and uh, sacred green uh, sacred spaces um, has been really uh, an important piece of leadership in the across the country, challenging and inspiring long-term thinking about our place as faith communities. And I'm sure you all know the building conversation is so hard for many of us, particularly for faith communities facing shrinking numbers um, and growing lists of repairs that are needed. And so it's, it's a tender place to be having that climate conversation, but also such an important and um, and fruitful one in many cases. Um, you know, um, I, I saw this in somebody's comment in the chat just a few moments ago, um, uh, the, the importance of how we talk about climate change. And I know that for years and years, we've been hearing solutions uh, fed to us um, in terms of climate action that are way out of line with the actual scale of the crisis. Uh, and I think that's unmotivating for people. And so, it matters that we call it a crisis, it matters that we call it an emergency, and then it matters that um, we engage our faith communities in real and tangible solutions from rallies to responsible investing to retrofits uh, that are possible and that are important and that give people a way to step into the solutions and move forward. So um, 
uh, all of those pieces, all of those great and inspiring success stories of faith communities leading on climate action are really motivating for me. Um, and I could spend like days telling all of those specific stories. I wanna tell one other story, which is more recent for me, which is around faith communities um, engaging in faithful public witness. And uh, this story is specifically about um, uh, a, commun a faith community, Grandview Calvary Baptist Church in my neighborhood, who showed up uh, to City Hall in support of uh, an important detox and recovery center in their neighborhood. So again, I'm sure we all know faith communities have been criticized uh, increasingly for being too inward focused, which is of course not at all, all true. Um, and occasionally a tiny bit true, um, you know, and that's what I think we grapple with as people of faith um, wanting to, to live into faithful public witness, that we have powerful voices. And when we mobilize to raise them in the service of the public good, particularly beyond our own walls, people notice uh, and it makes a difference. So as I said, this story is about a detox and recovery center and a social housing building that was being proposed actually not far from where I live to in the city of Vancouver. Um, there was a lot of neighborhood support for the um, for the building. We have a housing crisis here and a drug poisoning crisis and it's an important facility that we need. There was also a lot of neighborhood opposition to it that sort of ranged from it's too tall, there will be shadows, um, it will bring the wrong type of people into our neighborhood, we support the building but in a different location, uh, etc. Um, and Grandview Calvary Baptist Church um, that has uh, been in the neighborhood for a very, very long time, really uh, organized. They hosted community events. They put up posters inviting people to learn more and to show their support. Uh, they organized a drive amongst their members where members held up signs about why this building was an important part of living out their faith in their community and shared all of those with council. Um, and when the when the rezoning came to public hearing, they showed up and they spoke about it as a faith issue for them, not in trying to convert other people um, to their faith, which I think is some of what pe makes people nervous about speaking about faith publicly, but they spoke about how it's part of their own call to faith, to welcome those who are struggling as neighbors, not somewhere else, but right in their neighborhood, right in their community. And I uh, am not embarrassed to tell you that I was openly weeping during the public hearing. Uh, it, it significantly shifted the conversation um, not just to be debating, is this the right place? Is this, you know, a, a sort of debate about land use, which is a lot of what we do in local government, um, but to be uh, speaking about um, love of neighbor and care for neighbor in that way. Uh, it, it was incredibly powerful. So both of these pieces, I think, um, are really important. And what I'm keen to hear your questions on and get into some more um, details on with you is, um, the importance both of engaging our faith communities uh, beyond the typical voices and um, uh, certainly I'll speak to my own experience certainly in my home United Church communities there are you know maybe a dozen folks who you expect to hear from on every social justice issue and that matters and their voices are important but having them uh, bring out new voices too and hearing from more and more of the sort of non-typical voices on these important issues matters. Uh, and then it also matters that we speak in the public realm um, about these uh, as issues of faith, about the urgency, uh, about the need to ramp up our ambition and to um, embed equity in our climate work uh, and um, and push publicly on all of those pieces. Uh, Scott said it well, I think, um, in summing up that we should be informed by science and acting on faith, that's really such a key piece of how I have lived this work and what makes me excited about um, the overlap of, uh, of faith communities and climate activism. Um, I think I'm just gonna um, leave it 
there, though I see everyone has not asked questions uh, yet, but maybe our organizers have them, or I, I'm happy to just make sure we're leaving enough time for uh, some dialogue on wh whether there are specific questions about um, Hamilton region issues that uh, we can discuss or anything I didn't say enough about. I'll, I'll pass it to Katie on questions. Yes, yeah, so please feel free to write any questions um, in the chat and we'll start. I wonder if you can speak more to how Vancouver moved to passing a 50 by 30 target. Yeah, absolutely. So I was elected in 2018. Um, we actually had a pretty significant turnover in our local council that year. Uh, and most of us were elected newly um, the same month, October 2018, that the IPCC, the global climate report, the latest global climate report came out that really um, made clear that more clear than had been the case before the urgency that we at that time had 12 years to dramatically reduce our climate emissions in line with the science to really have any hope of maintaining a kind of reasonably stable and safe planet. So um, I felt that really clearly. Uh, I ran talking about climate in part, but also talking a lot about housing and indigenous rights and the drug poisoning crisis. Um, and the timing of that report with my election uh, really kick-started a number of things for me. So Vancouver has um, engaged in and had as a priority kind of the environment and greening for a number of decades, actually, across different uh, political representatives at City Hall. Um, it hasn't been, ex you know, it hasn't been a significantly polarizing issue here, um, which is a really great basis to be starting from. At the same time, our targets weren't in line with the science. Um, and in our most recent, uh, what we had been calling our Greenest City Action Plan, we had targets around uh, emissions, but also targets around waste um, and uh, uh, food, a number of other fronts. We had been doing a pretty good job of meeting all of our targets actually, except for the emission reduction targets. And so, uh, for me getting elected into office in light of the timing of that climate science report made really clear that we needed to uh, focus, we needed to amp up our ambition on the climate emission targets and that we really needed to focus our energy there. You know, um, for a long time in sort of sustainability discussions that, that I heard and was part of, we talked a lot about the low hanging fruit and I think it felt to me like in Vancouver, we had done a lot of the low hanging fruit and we had failed to do the rest of the fruit and we needed to get there. Um, and so uh, the first motion that I brought forward was a motion to city council asking that we um, recognize the scale of the crisis by declaring or naming the global climate emergency. And we were the first municipality in English speaking Canada, but there have been more than a hundred since to make that declaration. The second ask of it was that our staff report back within 90 days with a, a high level plan ramping up that ambition to meet the targets uh, outlined in the science. And then the third piece was that that plan embed a strong equity lens in it. And, and that had been missing from some of our past climate work too. And I think it's really important both because um, uh, climate change is exacerbating existing inequalities and because we had, um, we're losing trust from the public in a number of our sort of green or clim uh, climate actions because there was worry that they were furthering displacement for lower income people in the city, you know, and in a lot of cases they probably had an impact. I mean, our housing crisis is, the housing crisis is a global market failure, I would say, but um, uh, the distrust of green investments and, you know, active transportation infrastructure and whatnot uh, being linked to that was a challenge. Um, so we needed to make sure that we were um, very clearly looking at equity and where we were making those types of investments, who was benefiting, what risks were they uh, presenting for um, for housing and secure populations? How are we connecting stronger tenant uh, 
rights protections to those kinds of investments so that we were decreasing um, displacement of tenants. So all of that had to just be better connected and uh, with more of an intersectional approach. So that was the work. It sort of continued since then. The report came back to City Hall 90 days later. The first motion passed unanimously. That was great because Vancouver's current city council is pretty um, politically diverse, uh, I will say. So it was great that it passed unanimously. The next report passed unanimously. And then we've had the kind of more detailed and fleshed out pieces come back to us over the year and a half since. Um, and they haven't all passed unanimously because they're hard decisions that we need to make. Um, and some of them really get to the root of some pretty emotional issues for people. So we've been talking about mobility pricing and citywide parking permits for people parking their private cars on public city street spaces. And those are um, not the low hanging fruit anymore. We are not in the territory of like the feel good solutions uh, for everyone. And so it, it um, it's hard. And when we get into those pieces, it is especially important that we have folks who are who are committed to us meeting those big ambitious targets show up and support the work that is the work that gets us there because we don't meet those targets by magic and uh, hand holding. We meet them by by making some um, pretty big changes in our cities that ha have all sorts of benefits, um, but that are change and uh, and people get nervous about change. So that's sort of where we're at now. We're less than the like, aren't we all feeling great about this good commitment we made? And we're more in the like, ah, um, stage uh, of it. I think that's the technical term for the stage we're in, but I don't know for sure. Can I just draw attention to a great question in the chat? This is wonderful, Christine. I'm really, I think people are getting very engaged. There's lots of questions. Norm asks, what are some ways of engaging congregation members whose voices are not usually heard on social justice issues? And you, ra you raised that idea already, so I'd love to hear more of you. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think a lot about um, something called a ladder of engagement. So there are lots of folks in our congregations who, um, you know, they've, they've heard the Earth Day sermon every year, they understand concerns about climate, they're not really sure how to get involved. Um, and we need to find ways to um, help those folks step into engaging and then keep inviting them into further and further engagement. I think one of the challenges is that, as I said, the solutions that we've been offered um, are so uh, out of line with the scale. They maybe are good entry points, but they can't uh, by any means be the final point. So maybe people's first entrance is a sort of, um, you know, a fireside chat about some personal lifestyle stuff or your own footprint kind of measurement, helping people understand it and just feel some agency um, that they can do something. But we need to keep moving people along from that because when we know we're not gonna solve the problem if we all just take one less car trip or whatnot, we need more transformative change. So I think, um, being strategic about how we welcome people in where they're at, um, you know, not expecting that their first step is going to be getting themselves arrested, resisting a uh, uh, pipeline, um, but uh, that we meet them where they're at and then we give them opportunities to further engage. I think that that needs to be where the work is. Um, we know there are lots of allies in all of your faith communities, but you know, they're busy or they're not sure what to do. And so that's the work is, that's the, that's the internal work is um, supporting folks in finding their own path. Um, and it's not all gonna look the same. I mean, I know there, you know, there's work across all of these kinds of sectors. So if somebody in your community has spent their career in uh, healthcare, maybe they're still working in healthcare, maybe they're retired, there might be specific work that they, uh, feel particularly excited about in terms of how uh, climate overlaps with changes that are needed in healthcare. You know, I, I don't know that work, but I am sure that it needs to happen and that that person who's excited about it needs to do that work. So I think that's the other piece is, is really meeting people where they're at, but, but uh, continuing to push uh, and invite folks to be acting at the scale of the crisis in the places. We need all of your voices and more in all of the places and more. And so um, 
some of our work as organizers is to help people find their place and, and their voice and all of that. Um, I want to draw attention to one other question. There are lots of great questions, and I hope that we can get to all of them. Uh, Aiden is asking, what role have youth taken in pushing the 50 by 30 goal in Vancouver? And I think I, I draw attention to that one because it's important for climate. It's also a very important piece for faith communities in general, at least the ones that I'm most familiar with. Keeping youth engaged is just like the, the perennial question. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I love that question locally um, because uh, it, the um, leadership of young people was really significant in Vancouver passing its climate emergency declaration and in every decision since uh, I got to work quite closely with um, a local group of high school climate activists called the Sustainability Teens, as well as some uh, uh, older young people, young leaders um, from local colleges and universities who were engaged in climate work when I brought forward the first motion. Um, a group of young climate activists organized a big rally at City Hall. There were hundred of folk, uh, hundreds of folks there. Um, and then they signed up to speak to the motion at City Hall. Um, and they spoke very articulately about the way that these decisions would impact their future in the city. Um, and then these were in pre-COVID days um, when we were meeting in person, they stayed, they, they filled city uh, council chambers and they watched us deliberate and vote uh, on these things and really felt to me, I'm the youngest member of our council, um, it felt to me like a moment of sort of intergenerational reckoning, like they had told us very clearly how important this was to them. And then they watched us vote. Uh, on whether or not we took their words seriously. Um, and I think that made a big difference in the uh, first couple pieces of this work passing unanimously at this council, um, because I think this council really did hear their voices and take those concerns seriously. Um, and that needs to continue to be important. You know, we even have occasionally at this um, politically diverse council had debates about uh, who, are we just making decisions for current taxpayers of the city or are we making decisions for, you know, all current and future residents of the city? And, and uh, our current council doesn't seem to totally agree uh, on that front, but I can tell you, I feel very strongly um, that we're making decisions uh, that should be looking at what's in the best interest of current and future generations. And so the voices of these young people is so, critical, they're going to be living in this city a lot longer um, than some of the usual voices who are most accustomed to signing up and speaking at City Hall. Um, all of those voices matter, of course, um, but it's a shift in, uh, certainly in Vancouver and kind of who, uh, whose priorities decisions are made around. And so I feel really strongly about amplifying the voices of those young folks. And also it just gives me so much life in a very exhausting role to get to work alongside them and see how uh, what clarity they feel about this kind of work. Um, uh, that was a long answer because I just could speak endlessly about how much I love working with young climate activists. Um, but I will also say in my in my faith world, um, I hear that tension too. like when I got to work with Faith in the Common Good when I was doing divestment work, um, I found it a really useful tool to bring young people into those communities and, and hear, in my case, the predominantly uh, older members of the faith communities I was working with, um, give them a chance to get to hear from young people, hear their concerns, um, and, and then work with them and build those relationships. And I was really moved by how much interest there was in faith communities and building those relationships um, and moving forward together. I think, you know, ultimately, um, it's uh, it's a stronger direction to be building intergenerational movements. And the young people I get to work with have a lot to learn from so many of the um, older activists in, the, in our communities who have been doing this work for decades, who know it doesn't get solved immediately, who have been showing up like year after year and decade after decade, who were involved in the anti-apartheid divestment movements. I mean, there's such richness in all of those stories and, um, and young activists 
who are keen to learn those because that's the world that they, that's the life that they want to be doing this work for decades. So I do think there's such an opportunity to give and learn from one another across generations. Um, and uh, it makes our movement stronger. But also, as I said about my work with young climate activists, I think it just, um, it's a bit of a, a balm for all of our kind of weary souls in this work that we would get to hear from and learn from uh, one another and um, and work together and keep showing up together in it. So um, all of that, uh, all of that matters. Uh, and I think it's really important. We got another question here asking about um, how you're managing the major change in Vancouver to get people more comfortable with the changes that council is, is bringing forward. Um, and also, I think that can be a paralleled question in terms of within faith communities, how do you manage major change and pushing for major change? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so how are we managing it in Vancouver? I mean, we do a lot of public engagement and outreach and education, um, and it's imperfect. When we first started talking about mobility pricing, um, there was a big campaign from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, um, who were a, a well-funded um, anti-tax uh, lobby group. Um, a very active campaign on talk radio and elsewhere about how terrible this was with a lot of misinformation. And because they are well uh, better funded than our city communication department um, and their message was more ragey and populist, um, they got a lot of airtime. And so the information that they were sharing about what was being proposed, which was incorrect, was what most people were hearing. Um, you know, and I don't place that blame on on residents who were hearing this is suddenly going to be a $700 a year charge and you know it's going to push low income people out of the city people got kind of panicked and it seemed like a bad idea and that presents a real challenge um and so we have to be uh, extra proactive about making sure that people hear um from from us as the city and then the people hear from other environmental organizations faith communities and more that um, that they get the right information and that they understand how these kinds of difficult uh, policy tools connect to the goal that we agree is important about addressing the climate crisis at the scale needed um, and with equity consideration. So that's one piece, um, you know, and, and I guess I'll just say like, it's hard, it's an uphill battle because there's so, um, much invested in nothing changing. There's a lot of um, money on the line for a, uh, a lot of um, people uh, and industry in not changing anything. Uh, and so we face big challenges in putting forward bold solutions because um, of that resistance. Uh, and you know, I think one of the strengths in all of that work um, needs to be relationships. Uh, so I put a lot of energy there. I mean, I can't combat the resources of a well-funded lobby group, um, you know, actively working with talk radio and uh, conservative pundits on it, but I can continue to show up like, you know, I do those radio spots, even though I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail out of them. Um, I try to keep showing up and answering people's questions honestly and assuming good intentions and explaining the information as much as possible. And then I, I also stay in touch regularly with um, folks I've known and worked with for many, many years in environmental groups, um, in social justice groups across the city so that we can be working together and so that those lines of communication are clear and um, folks know how they can show up and help. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, some of it in Vancouver just comes down to being clear and transparent and um, trying to maintain as much trust with the public as possible that this is gonna be hard um, and you know we're gonna do it together. The other thing that stands out for me is even in a place like Vancouver, we're never going to get 100% agreement on the kinds of changes that we need to make, particularly not 
um, at the speed at which we need to make them. And so one of my sort of grounding uh, pieces when I'm making these decisions is that I feel clear um, that we don't need everyone to agree with the decision, uh, with the policy to go ahead and make it. We quite frankly just don't have the time to seek consensus on every policy decision needed to address the climate crisis at the scale that we face. We don't need everyone to agree, but we can't leave anyone behind. We can't think of anyone as um, uh, as disposable or not important in the in the decision. So, you know, you may not agree with me on uh, the scale and speed at which we need to address this crisis, but um, but your life and livelihood in the city is still going to be important to me in how I shape those policies. Um, so that's sort of the balance I try to take. Sorry, I didn't get at all to the faith part of that question, which I also sort of forget because I got down my own rabbit hole about how it's hard. Um, that's all good. We have another question here about um, how uh, your council has been able to make uh, use of connections to faith communities and community-based organizations um, to kind of help this movement forward and maybe even dismantle some of this um, misinformation? Yeah, it's a great question too. You know, my sense from having done multi-faith work, multi-faith organizing across the country is that um, those networks are, are weaker in Vancouver. Um, Vancouver is a pretty secular city uh, and there's not a lot of faith-based mobilizing around climate. There's not none, um, uh, but it's not nearly as strong as, it, as I know it is in many parts of Ontario, certainly not as strong as it was in California where I got to, to uh, attend graduate school. Um, so on climate, um, we do more work with environmental organizations and community organizations than faith groups. Um, though I think it would be great to have more faith voices involved. Um, our city staff uh, have relationships with, um, with environmental organizations as well as with uh, academics at the local universities who I know um, they provide some updates and touch points too about the climate work to get feedback um, and when plans are coming out to help do that, not to drive their own agenda, but to help make sure that clear and accurate information is being circulated to the public through those networks. Um, and I try to do the same thing. I have, you know, little um, lists that I have in like Word documents and Excel spreadsheets. It's very low tech here in my uh, home office slash bedroom at this point. Um, but I also try to make sure I'm maintaining that communication and checking in with folks and letting them know when different work is coming up so that they can reach out to their lists and their members and um, kind of expand those circles of, uh, of information and engagement. Um, maybe I'll just add, I think social media is a useful tool on that. I uh, am cautious to over rely on social media because it's also very toxic and terrible in all of our lives, um, but it is a useful tool for communication. And so I put, I try to make sure I'm putting enough energy into those places that I, I can also be engaging um, and, and particularly amplifying important work um, through those tools as well. They don't they can't replace face-to-face uh, -face, uh, real relationships, um, but they're an important tool to use as well. Okay, thank you so much. We have a lot of great questions, but I think we just have time for one more. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to how faith groups um, can cooperate with and seek guidance from our Indigenous neighbors. Um, do you have any experience in that you can speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think there too, um, relationships are so important as the first place. Uh, um, I remember there's a faith community um, just outside of Vancouver uh, who I who I know. Um, their uh, their congregational building is right near uh, 
uh, First Nations Reserve, um, and they really wanted to get to know that nation better. Um, and I remember um, their uh, lead minister reached out to me um, in helping, wanting to figure out how to build that relationship. And they had offered um, the, the faith community, the church had reached out and said, we'd love to build a relationship with you. And, you know, what if we did a series of, of dinners together where we could all get to know one another well? Um, which as a, uh, someone raised in the United Church is like, you know, committees and potlucks, very comfortable for us. Um, and the First Nation um, responded and said, like, we're actually, we're busy fighting a pipeline that would decimate our traditional territory. Um, we really appreciate the outreach. Uh, having a meal with you is not something we have time for right now, but we really appreciate financial donations to support our legal battle against this pipeline. Um, and the congregation had a hard time with that as a response. The congregation was like, oh, but we wanted to, you know, what this looks like for us is nice meals together where we become friends. Um, and uh, I think that was a really important lesson um, because, you know, in, the, in recognizing the histories that we exist in and the power and differences that we exist in, um, what those first steps look like need to really be at the um, leadership and direction of local First Nations uh, as nations or as urban Indigenous populations that our priorities and our strategic vision of how that goes may not align with theirs. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's a conversation like any relationship, but it really needs to center their needs um, and their voices in the work, um, particularly to balance out the, the historic imbalance and the current power imbalance in those relationships. So, you know, I, I, I think that's challenging for all of us because we have a way that we think that needs to look like. Um, and I would just say, I, I think those first steps, you know, and quite frankly, the second step and the 10th step uh, need to be about, um, solidarity uh, and that happens by asking what do you need from us and then showing up and doing it and then asking what else do you need from us and then showing up and doing that and doing that enough times um, that that you have built some trust uh, amongst one another and and then there's a bit more ground for some you know more honest mutual conversation um, but all of those first steps need to be really guided by uh, what Indigenous nations uh, and Indigenous communities need uh, and want in this moment. Thank you so much, Christine, for um, all your wisdom that you've shared. We really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for um, sending in your questions. There were so many, and I apologize we couldn't get to all of them um, at this time, but we want to make sure that we keep engaging with these questions um, with each other as we move forward, um, working for uh, addressing the climate crisis locally here in Waterloo Region. Um, so thank you so much, Christine. Um, and speaking of how we can continue uh, to stay engaged with these issues, I'm gonna pass it over to Kai, who's gonna share a bit about um, some next actions we can take. Sure, and uh, yeah, I just wanna echo again that uh, huge, huge thank you, uh, Christine, for your wisdom. Uh, I was scribbling down notes. Uh, there's just so much um, in there, and I, I really, um, I, I know that we have so much uh, to learn both from the collective wisdom in our own community and from what others are doing uh, right now across across Canada and across the world. So I'm gonna be brief and I'm just going to share um, a few opportunities uh, from the 50 by 30 campaign uh, and uh, faith climate justice uh, to engage. And I think we've tried to present kind of a, a range of options because uh, like uh, Christine was saying, you know, it's it's very important to start with um, the areas that that you see as an entry point into engaging with with this work. And um, I also just want to acknowledge that you know many folks on this call have have probably already been doing this um, work, and some for much longer than I have. 
Um, and we're deeply grateful for that. Like I, in many ways, this event is meant to be kind of um, how do we build together? Um, and that's all the more important to think through when we've been physically distanced um, due to the pandemic. So some of the ways uh, that the 50 by 30 campaign is encouraging folks um, to take action include uh, signing our uh, petition to, uh, that's calls on the region to commit to a 50 by 30 target uh, that is available through our site. And it's great if you can also uh, share that with, um, with your broader community. I mean, uh, we really want to show greater support for this. There's also a pledge on our site that um, uh, is essentially uh, just sharing support for the 50 by 30 campaign. And once we kind of hit a, a critical mass of uh, organizations, businesses, um, faith communities that uh, have shared with us, you know, this really matters to us, um, then we'll, we'll share that on our, on our site as well. And again, that um, helps give added, an added push um, and then joining the uh, movement in terms of getting involved with the campaign, uh, we have uh, uh, kind of a, a, a simple onboarding where anyone who's, who's interested to do this work will connect with one of our uh, team members. Um, and we're calling this, you know, being a, a 50 by 30 uh, climate champion. Um, and I, uh, Collectively, you can help us to bend the curve, uh, which is really what this is about. Um, and champions do all kinds of things from uh, writing in letters to your local newspaper, uh, contacting your counselor, um, you know, sharing a short, uh, short video saying, you know, this is this is why climate action uh, and justice matters to me. Um, and so all of this is about a push um, to flatten the climate curve over the next uh, 10 years, which ultimately is about our collective um, survival on this planet um, and caring for the next generation. And we just really want to emphasize that our region um, can be a leader on this. Uh, so on the note of uh, kind of regional leadership, uh, some of you may know that the regional official plan is um, currently under review for how Waterloo uh, and, and being updated um, for how Waterloo region will develop uh, moving forward. And part of this includes a, a climate change policy uh, document, um, which we think there's a lot of really good work in. Um, and there's an opportunity until the end of the month uh, to weigh in on that. There's a, a public survey. Um, and so uh, part of what we'll, we'll share in follow up is um, some suggestions for just weighing in on that to be sure that, you know, the, the region is hearing from us that we support uh, the bolder action that they're suggesting um, and encourage going even further. Um, so I always love the role of art. Uh, that's uh, a vision um, of what a, a more just green Waterloo region might look like. Of course, there's many, many visions. Um, and collectively, we want to help to catalyze um, a more positive future for all of us um, over the next 10 years. Uh, and so while it's easy to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on the numbers, really this is about catalyzing that beautiful um, transition um, in solidarity with so many throughout the community. Uh, we've been partnering with Land Back, hence the representation in the, in the image here as well. Um, for faith climate justice, uh, an opportunity that um, has been shared is uh, the, the option for congregations to hang um, a beautiful uh, banner or, or communities of faith, I should say, um, if you so choose, um, as a, a, a way of sharing publicly um, that this matters. And um, 
this this banner uh, was uh, designed actually over many design iterations um, to arrive at, at what I think is a pretty stunning, uh, beautiful creation. And all of that will help to kind of give this push um, throughout the region that uh, that we're not, uh, none of us are silent on this, that this is something that we are all concerned um, about. Um, and the, the website um, is essentially meant to be like a resource sharing platform so that faith communities can share with each other different ways to um, engage on climate justice. Uh, please mark the date that on March 9th, which is a couple weeks from now, um, we are hoping to have an open dialogue uh, with any faith communities interested in continuing this work. And so it really is a dialogue where we'll, we'll actually be hearing a lot from um, all of you, uh, including the work that's already ongoing that we can maybe help build bridges, build connections to, to keep that going. Um, and then this is being organized in conjunction um, with the Ecumenical Climate Justice Alliance here in the region, uh, which uh, started uh, before uh, faith climate justice, and we are essentially trying to help grow this together. Um, all of that will be shared in follow-up. And uh, for 50 by 30, just as a final pin, we're going to be hosting another evening of what other municipalities are doing around the world uh, to really uh, build on tonight's knowledge from Christine. Um, and invite in local councillors and municipal uh, leadership, as I hope there are some here tonight as well. Um, so we're just going to continue to build on this good work and that date is um, to be determined. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter uh, on the 50 by 30 site. Uh, we are very infrequent, uh, but we will help keep you up to date um, with what's coming up. And I believe, uh, Laura, you have a, some comments around food forests and anything I may have missed there. We didn't miss anything, thanks. And I did adjust my volume. This is, uh, so hopefully you can hear me better this time. Um, so I just wanted to tell it first, I just wanna say thanks so much, Chris. Your energy and your experience are amazing and are absolutely perfect for what we need to hear right now. So thank you. It's been marvelous to listen to you. And I gather this is being recorded, so I'm gonna listen again because there's so much in there. Um, anyway, I, uh, I wanted to tell you a bit about a project at uh, Divest Waterloo and Faith in the Common Good. We uh, received some funding through the region of Waterloo's Community Environment Fund. And there's so many people here from different faith groups, I thought you might be interested and it's to support the creation of food forests with eight different faith communities across the region. So we're calling it the Faith Food Forest Project. Um, food forestry uses biomimicry, a regenerative and restorative solution to agroecology that imitates nature. So mimicking natural systems of a forest, this decreases maintenance. So I know a lot of faith communities have gardens, um, they can be um, uh, a challenge to maintain. The idea of faith, uh, food forests is that um, it's, they're planted as a fedge and they kind of look after themselves for the most part after they're planted. And so we're really fortunate. We've got some amazing uh, folks with us working on this project. Uh, Nicola Thomas, she's a permaculture design consultant. Um, you may know her as the founder of Grand River Food Forestry. You can check out that website if you want to learn more about food forests. They're just beautiful. And Mika Moose, uh, who is also uh, Dr. Andrew Judge, and many of you will remember um, Andrew's good work at Rare. He created that beautiful Indigenous garden and teaching space um, there, and he's presently an assistant professor of Anishinaabe studies at Algoma. Uh, university where he specializes in traditional Indigenous knowledge, ethnomedicine, and land-based learning. So um, we're going to have a kickoff event, uh, hopefully uh, before the end of March, and I really wanted to nail down the date before tonight, but couldn't. And um, that will be an opportunity for um, Andrew to share his knowledge and, uh, and his wisdom around um, uh, connecting with the land and food forests and uh, to learn more about what they are. Nicola will be there too to explain uh, her role in the project. 
And basically from all of the organizations that attend that, um, you can take the information back uh, to your groups. And we, we have funding to support eight groups across the community, across the region, I should say, um, to have a, a food forest, like a workshop for your congregation or your faith community and your neighbors. Because the cool thing about food forests is that it's basically free food growing for everyone. Um, so it's a great way to engage with your uh, community neighbors. And you'll also, if you're one of the eight, you get Nicola's expertise to design and site the garden. She'll be there for the planting. We actually have the budget um, through this generous grant from the region to pay for a vast majority of the, um, of the plants that would become the fedge. And again, fedge is a food hedge. Um, and also Nicola will support that planting and then give you advice about how to maintain it and augment it over the years so that you can have this beautiful um, legacy food forest. So if you're at all interested in this, um, I thought when uh, Chris was talking about meeting people where they are and it's a great way to invite them into the conversation um, uh, about our relationship with the land and with each other. Um, so uh, if you're on the Divest Waterloo mail out list, you'll get an invitation for sure. And if you're not, you can send me a quick email at laura at divestwaterloo.ca. But the easiest thing to do um, would be when you're on our 50 by 30 uh, website, signing the petition and making that pledge, uh, sign up for the newsletter as, as as uh, Kai mentioned, uh, it, we don't send it out very often, um, but we'll tell you about all of our events. Really, that's what it's for. And this event will be included in that. So um, be sure and sign up for that if you haven't. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. We're going to wrap up here now that it's 8.30. Um, so I want to say again, a big thank you to Christine Boyle for all of your wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change um, and Chris Fletcher for his video um, and for all of you for taking the time uh, to come to this event and to listen and to engage. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and also a thank you to Mennonite Church Eastern Canada for um, letting us use their Zoom platform to make uh, this event possible. Um, so before we end, I'm just going to end with um, a prayer from Interfaith Power and Light from their Faith Climate Action Week. Um, and I'm going to post um, a link here to more prayers and blessings from their work. So we hold the earth. We hold siblings who suffer from storms and droughts intensified by climate change. We hold all species that suffer. We hold leaders delegated to make decisions for life. We pray for the web of life um, that may be mended through courageous actions to limit carbon emissions. We pray for right actions for adaptation and mitigation to help our already suffering earth community. We pray that love and wisdom might inspire our actions and our actions as communities, so that we may with integrity look into the eyes of our siblings and all beings and truthfully say we are doing our part to care for them and the future of the children. May love transform us and our world with new steps towards life. Thank you all so much for coming and yeah, we hope to uh, keep this work going here in our region. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.